Before we take an adventure to place our IMO boxes and collect IMO 1, it's always good practice to clean and sanitize your boxes or hex collectors as I like to call these. This one has a metal screen you can see on the bottom. I've used many different sizes and shapes and materials for collecting IMO 1 and building boxes and baskets including the hollow boxes in Hawaii to cedar planks. The material you use to build your IMO boxes should be a natural material that has some porosity which easily allows for these microorganisms and mycelial networks to grow into the substrate. After scrubbing with vinegar, a nice sun bath of UV rays is really beneficial to further help to sanitize these boxes before collections. These boxes here were constructed using quarter inch pine wood. I would avoid using woods like redwood or western red cedar that have antimicrobial properties. You can also see there were several holes drilled into the bottom slats of finishing trim to increase the permeability. So washing our rice is an important step when it comes to culturing IMO. This will be our substrate that we're going to use as a food source to grow these indigenous microorganisms. And we want to wash the rice until the water is translucent, no starches. This method here was inspired by Native American tribes that would wash their acorns in the riverside of tannins to then further process into flour. The obvious disadvantage is that we don't always have a creek and you also can't collect the rice wash for further making labs. So this second method of washing rice is a little more practical for households. Placing some rice in a bucket and washing it off in your shower is another method you can use. Typically it takes about four washes of filling and pouring off until we get a translucent water from our wash. Just as in nature, there is no waste. In natural farming methods, there's also never any waste. So we can use this rice wash now to culture lactic acid bacteria. Or we can also use this rice wash for feeding our plants alone. It's high in minerals and nutrients. In this case, I'm choosing to culture lactic acid bacteria. So I'm hiking this bucket closer to where I will be growing near the greenhouses. This is a great method for culturing really any cultures when it comes to Korean natural farming and Jadam. Culturing near your gardens means you're culturing microorganisms that are acclimated to the microclimate and environment where you will be using them in the garden or farm. Cooking rice is an important step when it comes to the process of culturing indigenous microorganisms. Typically what we want to do is cook the rice a little bit hard cooked. Maybe al dente is a good word for this. However, depending on the environment, the bioregion you live, I've realized that this can vary. From doing collections in Hawaii versus collections, say, in Idaho, Eastern Oregon, or South Dakota. I've noticed these climates can be a lot more dry so it's worth cooking your rice a little bit more well done and also more moist. Or if you're in a more tropical region then you can cook your rice a little bit more dry. So add the amount of water that you need to cook rice specifically for your region to optimize that rice for the best possible collections in your region. These subtle nuances do make a difference in the end result. So I'm using a spatula that was sanitized with vinegar to scoop in the rice. I don't want to be touching the rice, the substrate, with my hands or anything that isn't sanitized. Otherwise we're adding bacteria and yeast and other fungal spores that could culture on this rice. 
And the overall aim is to culture beneficial soil microorganisms. So we want to keep our utensils and tools very clean when using a substrate for IMO culturing. These boxes I'm filling a third of the way up with rice. Now some would say to do that two thirds. The thirds rule is used in Korean natural farming often. So this is working with the golden ratio. And I have great collections and great results when I add a third rather than two thirds. If you have too thick of a layer of rice, then oftentimes you just won't get the growth that you're looking for. It could take a lot longer. And typically from my experience, it just doesn't culture as well as the thinner layers of rice. You might ask, why are we culturing on short grain sushi rice? And the simple answer to that is the region where this method was developed in Korea and Japan, this is what was prominent and available to use. Could you then use other substrates to culture indigenous microorganisms? One, and the answer is yes. However, for the sake of simplicity and tradition, we're going to use the rice in this video and we'll save that for another video. Here I'm using organoleptics to sense if there's any steam still coming off the rice before sealing these boxes up. Once the rice is cooled down and no steam is evaporating off the rice, we can go ahead and seal it up with paper and masking tape. It's advised that you definitely let it cool beforehand because the steam can create condensation and collect on the top of the paper in the box and create conditions that we don't want in the environment of our box. By sealing off the boxes, we've now created a atmosphere within the box and it helps to contain some of the moisture that is in the rice as well. Newspaper can also be used for this step, but definitely use something permeable. Winter time can be more challenging for collecting indigenous microorganisms one, so I'm going to share some techniques for helping with this season. Look at this, just gorgeous clumps of leaf mold with a lot of fungal growth on it. So I'm gonna take all these collections now that I've gathered from the land, which is a diversity of different cultures, different microclimates and different trees, uh, mainly deciduous. We're gonna start adding this to our tote. And then I'm gonna take my clumps and really add this to the top here. These fungal mats. So basically, now we've brought that leaf mold and topsoil under a greenhouse where we're covered from rains because if we were to be out there trying to collect in the rains, you know, that could go south. Too much moisture uh, can be a big problem. It can ruin and spoil your IMO one collection. So hence the reason I'm going this route. Uh, it's a nice technique for doing it in the winter. It's also warmer in here. So it stays warmer under this greenhouse, which is also going to speed up the process of collecting IMO one because typically in the winter time, you might be waiting two, three weeks to um, get any kind of growth on that if it's cold. You know, the colder it is, the slower the culturing and fermentation process goes when it comes to microorganisms. So always keep that in mind. And these are uh, some kind of hacks that we can do
10 days after burying our box in this leaf mold, we're ready to dig it up and unveil to see what kind of culture that we have on our rice. This for me is always the most exciting part of the process. Ah, and we can see that we have some nice classic fuzzy cotton candy white fungal hyphae and the little black dots are spore heads on the top of all those hyphae. This is a really good looking collection. Unveiling number two. And it looks like we have another decent collection here. Minimal color. Now, from a Jadon perspective, we're not worried about color. The more diversity, the better. From a traditional Korean natural farming standpoint, we are looking for more of the fuzzy white fungal hyphae dominant cultures. So it's important to process these IMO1 collections right after unveiling and harvesting these. And the next step will be adding one part organic sugar to our one part by weight IMO1. Here you can see this aggregate. This is sort of like tempeh where the culture of fungus has actually created an aggregate, a big clump of rice that's been fully inoculated with this fungal growth. Here I'm feeding some to the farm chickens as a little probiotic snack. IMOs can be added to feed and silage for farm animals as well. Back to the processing here. I'm now ready to add organic sugar. I always recommend using organic when possible. Our inputs and inoculants in KNF and Jadam are only as good as the ingredients that we're using. So here I'm adding one part by weight organic sugar to my IMO1 and I will thoroughly mix this up and break apart all the clumps of aggregate into a very homogeneous mix where we don't have any big chunks left and we don't have any pockets of sugar either. We want it really consistent all the way through to really maximize our preservation. Mixing is now complete and we're ready to store this in a jar. So I'm simply adding this into a gallon mason jar here. Depending on how much you have, that will determine the size of your jar. And I'm not being as careful as I could be because I do have a friend to help me clean up here. The targeted consistency we're going for is really on the drier side. We don't want a lot of liquid forming in our IMO2 cultures, like a thick liquid layer on top. If that happens, if we don't get our mixture correct, sometimes actually too much sugar can cause too much osmotic pressure and create uh, liquid cultures that we don't necessarily want. It also kind of depends on how the rice was cooked. We're aiming for super saturation, which means that every water molecule is now bound up with a molecule of sugar and we don't have excess of sugar or excess of liquid happening. This creates the ideal conditions for storing and preserving where microorganisms are dehydrated and cannot eat, frozen in a state of dormancy. After we pack in our IMO1 into the jar, we're aiming for about a two-thirds fill as well. Again, we're going for that thirds rule and leaving a third empty on top. From the many ferments that I do, I've realized this actually is a good rule of thumb for just about every ferment. You know, you want a little headspace on top 
However, you don't want uh, to fill it all the way to the top. And you also don't want to put a small culture into a big vessel because that leaves a lot of room and atmosphere where you have airborne pathogens or cultures that could move into your culture and spoil things. My friends are back to help with the cleanups here. Teamwork lightens the load. And here we have our finished IMO2s approximately two thirds the way full. All we need to do now is clean it up and add a paper towel and rubber band across the top. Preston Smith with Rogue Natural Farming, AKA the Microbe Hunter. I'm out here in the Southern Humboldt Forest looking for ideal IMO1 collection locations. And here behind me is a massive old growth with drone, as you can see. So we're going to look down in the soil and see what we can find. I love Madrone because it's a deciduous tree. And not only does it uh, drop its leaves, it also peels its bark, as you can see here. So all this bark peels off. At a certain time of year, if you're in the forest, usually late summer, you can actually hear the bark peeling and splitting off in a madrone forest. It's really cool. So all this drops to the ground, creates really beautiful mulch down here. You can see I have my IMO box over here. I have a little tarp, some stakes to put down because we have had some rains, actually had two inches of snow, uh, even on the lower elevations. So that's pretty crazy for Southern Humboldt here. So I'm also walking around and I noticed that the soil is really soft and squishy. There's a lot of give to the soil. This is another thing that I use my organoleptic senses. Really just tapping into our senses that we've adapted over thousands of years as being humans. You know, we have these sense organs that can tell us a lot about the natural climate environment that we're in. Something about Madrone I always love is uh, Arbutoid is a fungi that is known to be symbiotic with Arbutus, uh, the Pacific Arbutus, which is the Pacific Madrone here. So I already know that there's a symbiotic relation that forms from fungi with the madrone but just as i said walking along i really can tell that this is a good area based on how much coverage we have and how squishy this feels so let's dig in here and see what we can find and right away See, it's, everything's really wet. We've just had a bunch of rain, so rain can be a deterrent from getting good collections of IMO1. It can also be an activator of all the dormant spores that are there lying dormant. So this is really a beautiful place for a box. Um, what I'm gonna be mindful of, there's some valleys and kind of contours I would advise if you're in the rainy season to stay out of the low points in these natural contour areas. So these natural little creek systems and contours that have been created naturally, you wanna stay out of those real low places that can get flooded. Uh, we do have some poison oak in the mix right here. So be mindful of that if you're in a place where there is poison oak. So right here, looks like a great spot. It's a little bit higher. We're not in a depression and I'm digging just below the very top leaf mold. And I see a lot of nice webby mycelium here. I don't want to dig too much deeper 
into this, below this. I really want to, you know, interface with this mycelial network that we're seeing right here. So we don't want to disturb this too much, but this looks great. I feel good about placing a box. And as you can see, it's nice and damp. Anybody who's into mushroom hunting knows uh, after the rains is a good time to go out. So there's a, uh, it can be beneficial. You can work with the rains to get your good IMO one collections, but just be mindful that more moisture can also mean more anaerobic conditions. We are going for the fungal networks in the soil. So this is what's gonna help us build soil at our farms and our garden and help to progress that ecological succession of creating great soil, which is really moving towards a fungal dominant soil. <clears throat> Here we have a box that was designed by a friend and um, somebody I'm doing some consulting for here. This is a little bigger than I usually build my boxes, but not a bad design. And I'm just gonna cover the sides. We'll just push up all the leaf mold. So you'll notice this one also, I didn't put a screen on. Actually didn't have any extra screen around. All my other boxes are equipped with a metal mesh across the top here. This one does not have it. So we're just gonna work with what we have. Um, I'm gonna take some of this topsoil here and sprinkle it on top, not too much. But a lot of fungal growth we can see in this beautiful topsoil, this humus that's naturally forming. I get some of my best collections under these madrone trees, love them. So I found a tote here, and this will be great for weatherproofing our IMO box that we've placed here. So I'm gonna put a couple stakes in the ground. The big thing is with whatever you're covering your IMO one collection to weatherproof it, you always want to make sure you have a gap above it. Got the right height here. And I'm just going to lightly cover this box a little more with some leaves here. Just a few leaves. What we want to do is not suffocate, but also we want to hold in some moisture in here. That's the whole point of the paper across the top too. We're creating a little atmosphere within our box and we want to hold some of the moisture in because I'm not afraid of this drying out right now. It's uh, extremely wet with the winter conditions and the rains we've had, but you know, you never want your rice to completely dry out. You also don't want it to get too moist, too anaerobic. So a little bit of uh, leaves across the surface is gonna help to hold some of that moisture in there. So I think that's just fine right there. We're gonna drop this over the top tote okay and now you can see we have it tilted so we have some air flow into the area where we need air this is an aerobic culture of fungus so we never want to directly put a piece of plastic you know directly over the box itself uh, we always want some kind of airflow. So however you make that happen. So this is what it's looking like here. Protected from the rains. This is an aerobic culture that we're going for, a fungi. And what makes this kind of unique is, unlike propagating uh, a single species of uh, fungi or mushrooms, it's getting pretty popular these days, you know, 
we're not going for a specific type of fungus here. What we're doing is looking for whatever is prominent and whatever is uh, teeming through this forest and symbiotically connecting with the trees. That's gonna change obviously from forest to forest. And that's what we want is a diversity of these cultures. Ultimately, when you take our IMO one collections, we're gonna mix multiple collections together in culturing those on a, a substrate for IMO three and further up into IMO four. So we're looking for several cultures of these microclimates of these different trees and different forests and plants uh, because they associate with different fungal networks in the soil. So, you know, a friend of mine I was recently talking to was saying, well, they got one of their IMOs tested and they found out that it was rhizopus. And so there you go. Um, you might culture rhizopus. That doesn't mean everywhere you go, you're looking to culture rhizopus fungus. Um, by the way, rhizopus orizae is the fungus that is used for culturing tempeh. Uh, that's how I learned to recognize that one. I've cultured some tempeh before. So interesting that that was cultured for an IMO one collection. Um, now, I do know with the Pacific Madrone, Arbutoid is a symbiotic fungus that grows with the uh, Arbutus, the Pacific Madrone. So chances are, if you know the symbiotic cultures that grow with certain trees, for instance, Matsutake is also known as the pine mushroom. So you go to pine forests. Okay, I used to go to the greater Crater Lake area in Southern Oregon to look for Matsutake because it was all pine forest. So if you know the tree, then many times you can go find the mushroom you're looking for, right? Um, mushroom hunters know this. So we can kind of gauge our IMOs on like, okay, I have a better chance of collecting this. But again, we're not specifically looking for one monoculture. In fact, we're looking for many cultures, polycultures to, to grow those on a substrate and to create polycultures of the strongest fungi that are growing in these forests, right? And we'll let nature figure itself out. We'll let the plants send out the exudates and team with the microbes that they choose. We don't have to micromanage down to exactly the amount of certain microbes that we need to put in the soil, certain bacteria to fungi ratios and certain species that we know that team with certain trees and plants. The theory is really if we put those that we find from healthy forests into our gardens, into our farms, that the plants have an intelligence to figure that out for themselves. We don't have to micromanage and play the role of God to that degree. So as you can see, this collection did get raided by animals. We took a chance on it and really it's recommended to use a protective metal mesh, especially when collecting in the forest, which is too bad because looking at the sides, you can see that this looks like it would have been a really nice culture, but no worries. This is why we put out a lot of collections. We are expecting some rain, so I am preparing for that. I have a tarp over here some stakes so I'm going to essentially create a little umbrella covered area that is sheltered from any kind of weather storms we could have. I generally find really great collections by downed trees especially when you're in the middle of a deciduous oak grove. So check this out over here. Earlier I was looking along this log and you can see it's been down for a while um, because it's broken down a lot of moss growing on it clearly the root systems being eat it away i can break it apart with my hands so found some great collections over here earlier for a another collection we're doing in a bin and then i also took some from over here because i was seeing some really great mycelial networks but let's just look at the base of this uh, tree 
And look at that. This is what I was finding earlier. Just big clumps of this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful networks of this mycelium here, right in that topsoil. And we really don't want to dig a whole lot past this because that's what we want to tap into with our box right here. Just basically plugging in with our substrate and collect a piece of that mycelial network. So we're going to just plug right into this. I think this is a prime location for putting a box here. Here I have one of my hex sided collection IMO collectors here. I hesitate to call it a box. So the theory behind this is you don't find right angles in nature. So if we're trying to do a harmonious design for nature, well, the hex definitely shows up in nature. Um, I'm reminded of honeycomb from beehives. So we're gonna place this right down into this beautiful mycelial mat that we found here, just gorgeous. And like I said, you don't wanna disturb, you know, these growths that you find. We wanna uncover them so we can essentially tap right into it. We wanna we want interface with that network. So the bottom here is interfacing with that network. You know, and we'll just nestle it. We don't want to smash it. Just place it right there. And now we're going to cover this up. And we're out here in the woods. So, you know, this isn't gonna stop a bear from getting in here, but it will stop a rodent. It's placed right. Typically, I don't have many issues with bears. Wood rats tend to be an issue in Northern California hills. So now we have a covered IMO collection box covered with this basket. So this is just a added layer of protection from rodents. There are wood rats out here, um, other curious little critters, raccoons, foxes, coyotes. Next thing we're gonna do is weatherproof this because we are expecting some rains so i have a little tarp here i brought and some stakes So what we want to do whenever we're covering an IMO collection is not try to suffocate it or trap too much moisture in there. Typically what we want to do is really let it breathe, let some air flow below. So here under this tarp is my IMO one collection. We covered it in leaves, put a basket around it and then I placed a bucket right next to it, not over it, but next to it to kind of create a teepee effect to give some space so that water can basically drain off that high point down 
And now I'm gonna cut some stakes to stake this down. So in case we get winds, um, this isn't gonna take off flying. All kinds of beautiful fungus growing on here, moss, all kinds of life. Really nice around here, right after the rain. Here's our Oak Savannah IMO collection. You can see the tarp that we staked down over the top. And one thing I wanted to point out was not only are we protecting it from the rain over there, but you can see the sun is hitting it and we're creating like the greenhouse effect underneath there, helping to encourage a warmer climate that is more conducive to culturing indigenous microorganisms. The temperature really plays a huge role So first glance, nothing real visible here, not too exciting. And as I dig through, the rice seems to be a bit dry, surprisingly considering all the rains we've had. However, digging through, I am finding some clumps of aggregate. You can clearly see some of the little fungal hyphae hairs along with some of the black spore heads. So I'm gonna keep some of these clumps Digging through this collection, it's clear to see that the rice was cooked just a bit too dry. Not much growth happened on this collection. However, there are a few clumps of aggregate that we're keeping. But for the most part, you can see that the rice really breaks free and is very loose. Whereas with some of the better collections, we're going to see an aggregate form and create a clump through the whole collection of rice. So this collection here has more growth visible. We can see the fuzzy, hairy fungal hyphae with the black spore heads that we will go ahead and process into equal parts sugar. Underneath this box, we can clearly see the mycelial networks in the topsoil here.
Traditionally in Korea, IMO hunters would gather together in groups to cook rice and go off into the bamboo forested areas to put their cultures out in hopes of getting great collections of IMO. First glance, the paper looks like it's been removed as if a rodent got in here, but I don't see any signs of intrusion through the metal screen, so I think it might have been broken down by the moisture. At first glance, this collection doesn't have much visible growth on it, but upon further inspection as I dig into this, you can really see that there's a lot of visible fungal hyphae that is growing consistently through this, creating a nice aggregate. The bottom, you can really see, this is a beautiful collection here. This truly is proof that you can't judge a book by its cover. This collection has been one of my best on this round of collections thus far. And it really illustrates an important point about IMO. IMO is really the fungal and microbial life that we're culturing from the soil. It is not airborne cultures we're after. Here we are again processing our IMO1 shortly after collecting our boxes. You want to process these within 20 to 30 minutes of harvesting your IMO1s. So again, we're adding our equal parts IMO1 to our organic sugar one-to-one -one by weight. This is the bamboo culture that we collected. You can see this large aggregate. Unlike an earlier collection where the rice was still loose, this is similar to tempeh. It's a consistent culture of this IMO aggregate. Thoroughly mixing up our IMO1 bamboo culture with one part by weight sugar. You want to use an unprocessed sugar. A lot of times for us here in America, that's going to be a brown sugar. But if you have access to jaggery or evaporated cane sugar, anything that's as least processed and has as little pesticides or GMO, is always the best. Here we're filling our mason jar again. This culture is a half gallon mason jar. We want to fill these cultures up to two thirds full. After packing in the rice, we want to clean the top empty portion inside and out of any sugar residues to prevent any opportunistic ants or other pests that might be interested in this to keep it well preserved. And then top it with a paper towel and rubber band. You want to store your IMO2 cultures with a permeable cover to allow them to breathe. Last but certainly not least is labeling. We might think we can remember what our cultures are, but believe me, after some time has elapsed, you will definitely forget what cultures are what, especially if you keep a good library of cultures going. So on our labels, we want to list the location of our culture, whether that's a farm, a house, a park, a forest. We want to list the types of trees or shrubs that we were collecting under. We want to list the date 
noting the season with that date, and if possible, get a GPS coordinates on it with a elevation. You may also want to grade your collections. Now, from a more traditional Korean natural farming standpoint, you could stick to grades based on the colors that you culture. From a Jadam standpoint, though, you're really not using grades. It's kind of all acceptable. <laughs> You want to keep your IMO2 collection stored out of direct sunlight. A pantry or a root cellar environment that stays at a consistent temperature is the best storage-wise. Check out the IMO3.